Hey y'all and welcome back to another video of My Creative Life with Kel Sweetie where we make art, we read books, and essentially do whatever our creative hearts desire. Today we are covering my March wrap up and it was a very rough month unfortunately. The theme this month was Unhinged Women Written by Women for Women's History Month and I was excited for this topic. I was excited for this theme. I was like oh my god you're so smart for coming up with this really creative theme for Women's History Month. The joke was on me because one I one of my books was just not unhinged enough like regardless of what the like actual plot of the story was according to like the back of it I it just wasn't given unhinged another one of my choices was for the trans rights readathon and my first choice was I was informed on that author and we will get to it um so that was a no my first book that I read of the month was great and it was definitely unhinged and I'm glad that I listened to the audiobook but there was something missing from it I feel like now looking back on it another one was disappointing honestly I think I'm fighting for my life currently going into April to not get into a reading slump because of what happened this month so if you want to hear about how my month went keep watching and let's get into it So like I said, this month was not giving what it was supposed to give at all. <laughs> this month was supposed to be an unhinged women reading experience. I was supposed to come out of this feeling like I wanted all of my intrusive thoughts to win. And that is not what I came out of this month doing. I actually came out of this month wanting literally to read anything else but maybe unhinged woman which is crazy because that's my whole genre like i i love an unhinged woman main character unreliable narrator i came out of this month like really wanting to read anything but that like when i go into my tbr for my next video y'all are really going to notice that this month's downfalls <laughs> informed next month's tbr absolutely let's just kind of get into it. I made my theme this month based off of it being Women's History Month and considering I love to read any thriller or horror or my new word of the day speculative fiction um <laughs> but written by women with with just main characters who are women who just aren't frilly and pretty and feminine according to society standards and everything. I was so excited to make this TBR to read the books that I was supposed to be reading this month. And instead, I was so disappointed. <laughs> I think that my ratings, like looking at my ratings all together, it looked like I had not that bad of a month, but some of these ratings really pulled through because of other things in the books kind of upping the ante on on the rating like my here are my ratings no context for the month we had a, a four and a half we had a three we had a four and a half and we had a four which looking back honestly I might even give it a three and a half and we had two we had a dnf and a didn't even start a dns I don't think that's a thing, but we're starting it. Um, so looking at that, you're like, hmm, Kelsey, it seems like your month wasn't as bad as you're making it. I'll get into that. Starting with what was the four, but now looking back, probably is more of a three, which was The Power uh, by Naomi Alderman. I had heard from a couple of other booktubers about this book recently. And it had to do with body horror, unhinged women, and I was I saw that a lot of other people and books like booktubers and bookstagrammers were also kind of leaning into this theme for Women's History Month, and I heard about the power. 
this idea that women all of a sudden wake up one day and have this electrifying power and what does that mean now that only women hold this power for a society and I loved the idea that it wasn't simply women are in charge and that means that the entire world is perfect now because there's something in that that's misogynistic about the fact that women are so perfect or soft that if we had actual power the world would be this soft place but even then it's a complex idea because it also insinuates the fact that the only way we could as women ever be in any sort of power is if all of a sudden we woke up one day with superhero strength or or superhero powers and there's something about that that rubs me the wrong way as i've continued thinking about this book so it's it's difficult. It's a difficult review for this one. I originally, off of reading it, gave it a four, but now having some time, I think I would rather give it like a three and a half. I think I really appreciate what the book represents in its idea, but also that even in that idea, it's more layered than simply just women have power now and everything. It, it insinuates that women could only ever be in this sort of power structure if we woke up with superhero powers. And there's something problematic and nihilistic about that as well. I love how the book is set up, like this book inside of a book and this like history retelling. Um, there are emails in between a couple of chapters where um, this writer who is a man is trying to get his his editor to publish this book about women and the power when when the first cataclysmic event happened and everything when women took over. And the twist at the end is kind of really interesting in regards to that. There's the physical book I do recommend to pick up to read along with the audiobook because the audiobook has a full cast and that was amazing. But the physical book has like a bunch of illustrations within it that are really dope as well. Um, and I love that. I love when a book is more than just text, but that it has picture books aren't just for kids that like pictures and graphs and like graphics and stuff like that in a you know, literary book um, is really interesting to me. So I thought that was great. Surprisingly enough, the best character, I feel like the most rounded character in the book was the man of the book. <laughs> and that's interesting as well, that the main, one of the main people in the book who just really felt well-rounded was actually the only man point of view we had in the book um, while all this is going on. And that was also strange. I think there's there's a many different point of views in the book. I think there's four. Um, coming from Roxy, who is like basically the daughter of this British gangster. There's Eve, who is kind of this cult leader of a religion that's been born out of the event. Then there's also um our main character, Tunde who is who I was talking about, who I feel like is the most well-rounded in the book. And then there's the senator. I can't remember the senator's name right now, but there's the senator. And I, the senator was forgettable. I honestly don't even know why she was included in the story. I felt like every time the senator's point of view was a chapter, I was bored. I was waiting to get to the next chapter because honestly, I felt like the reason I get why she was included because of the politics and what this meant for women in politics and that point of view, I get that. I don't feel like her character was pointless from like a writer's point of view of why she was included. I just don't think that they wrote her chapters very well. <laughs> I I think that her character, she had no character arc really. Her storyline wasn't really enthralling enough in my opinion. Yeah, I, it felt like a second thought, including the senator. So I, I don't know how I felt about that. I loved Roxy. Roxy behind Tunde, honestly, was such an amazing character because there was such a huge character arc. There was an actual story behind Roxy. Um, Roxy felt like the heart of the entire book because she basically connected to two other characters of the point of view, which is also why the senator felt very pointless. The, the senator really did not connect at all with any one of the other 
three point of views. So it felt very much like, why did we include this person? Whereas Roxy connected with both Tunde and Eve at one point in the book. So I don't know, that felt really off as well. Roxy was just amazing though. I really, really loved her character arc. I really loved how complicated her story was and it felt interesting. Tunde was great. I think Tunde was surprising because you start off being like, okay, there's this one man in the book. Okay, we're going to hear his his story. To see kind of the the like events that happen during the book that are really brutal, but also in this way that women experience every single day. So you feel this complicated emotion as a woman reading that while you feel bad for this character who he himself may have not directly been a part of any evil or monstrosity that has happened from patriarchy um, and it, he's at the helm of a lot of that stuff that's happening, you still are just like, well, take it on the chin, buddy. Um, some parts of it are, are like that because you're just kind of this experience of like shock that's coming from this man who's never experienced or has been taught how to deal with these things in your life as opposed to women who are kind of taught how to deal with these things basically from birth because of just being preemptive or just experiencing them firsthand. I don't want to share too much about what he experiences because it it really is more interesting for you to, to, to kind of get introduced to that yourself. I think that his connection to another character is really amazing. And then there's Eve. And Eve's starting point was interesting. I think I love reading about cults. So that was also interesting to hear. I think the twist at the end on Eve and her character, I feel like was missing just a little bit of more shock value. But at the same time, um, I, I think that it's a great twist. I was, I think I just would have like preferred it to be just written just a little bit more over the edge on the shock. I feel like they explained it too much. Um, and it should have been more of a, the reader kind of comes to terms on figuring out the, the twist. So yeah, that was the, that's my feeling on it. I know that like, that sounds like, wow, well, why did you even give it a three and a half? It sounds like you didn't enjoy it. I did enjoy it. I did enjoy the point of view. I did enjoy like the basis of this book. I enjoyed that it was messy. I enjoyed that women were depicted as evil, that it wasn't just simply, oh, women got powers in the world, like became a great place again because they used that for good. Um, of course, there were moments and, and situations of that, but you, I think it was the point that when somebody who has been oppressed or has lived in a society that has told you you are oppressed by default for so long now has obvious power over that oppressor, what by human nature are you going to do about it with that new power that you weren't, that, that you weren't gradually given, you were just plopped in? And that sometimes what that means from human nature is that you will be, you will use that power over that oppressor to prove a point, to get back at them, to have revenge. And I love that that was in some parts. Now, there are portions that really, really break your heart. Um, trigger warning on rape scenes, which was another thing that I think that I was kind of interested in um, and kind of like, ha I feel like I still need to move through which is, I felt like at many points of the roughest parts of the book, rape was the harshest thing that happened in the books. The most evil thing that was happening in the books. And I think that that's saying something about the idea of what, I mean, I think Alderman was making it very clear that, that you know, for women, and what we experience in our society, rape is sometimes worse than a death. And that she was trying to portray that on an, on the opposite sex, on what that is. Especially in a society where people believe that rape is not possible towards a man. Like, no one can believe that a man can be raped by a woman whatsoever, which is completely incorrect and not true. And again, it, I mean, it's it's strange, but it is rooted in some misogyny as well, you know. And that happens quite a bit in the book. 
So, or even attempted rape. So, be sure to, if you have triggers towards that, that is most definitely in this book. I don't didn't regret reading it. I, I haven't heard of it before. Apparently it was on Obama's like list back in 2016 or something, his reading list, and a lot of people told me that. But I had never heard anything about the book. I think that it's still an interesting book to read, that a lot of women should read, that a lot of men should read. But I don't think that it's not without its flaws. And that's why I give it, I gave it a four off of first reading because of just the shock of like reading a book that was like that, that I'd never, I'd never read something like this really before. But now after coming down off of the high, three and a half kind of feels more appropriate for like my actual reading experience. But that, that three and a half, like, I think I've made it clear on this like channel that threes aren't me saying like, this isn't a good book. It's actually just like me saying like, this is a good book. I would recommend it. <laughs> so I would still definitely recommend it. I just think that it's not without its flaws, which I think tackling um, a storyline like that, there inevitably are going to be flaws. I don't think that like a book like this really has been written enough, like a plot like this has been written enough for there not to be like some sort of equation for it. So three and a half on that one. The next book that I finished took me forever to finish because of another book I was reading at the same time and a book that I DNF'd. And I think that I'm going to start with the D. I'm, I'm, you know what, I'm actually going to do the DNF because I'm going to do this in chronological order. Because after I finished Power, The Power, I went, huh, I'm going to read The Bandit Queens. Let me tell you about The Bandit Queens. The back of this book says, that this is a, a, a story about a South Asian Indian woman who in her town, in her, in her, like, what is it? Like, in her village, they believe that she killed her husband. She's never been caught. She did not kill her husband, by the way. She, her husband was horrible and he left one day and he was never found again. And that's, she loves that though, because he was horrible to her. And people don't mess with her because they think that she killed her husband. And she's like, well, good, don't mess with me. She doesn't have to get married again because all the men are like, mm, I'm not marrying her. And she's like, good, I don't want to get married again. So she's letting them believe, yeah, I killed my husband. Leave me alone. And I don't, I love that. I'm like, yes, absolutely, leave her alone. I was in love with that storyline. And, and what ended up happening is that other women in her village come to her and they're like I have a horrible husband tell me how you got away with it so we can get away with it with my husband and she goes hmm the jig is up I either tell them <laughs> that I did kill my husband and not experience all this great stuff that I've been experiencing or I sit here and I try and teach them how to kill their husband which I have no idea on how to do that sounds amazing right that's not what this book's about that is literally the basis of our main character, Gita, in the story. That that's why, like, people in the village, why she ends up in the story that she ends up in and the events that end up happening and stuff like that. That is why she's in it. I got to about 30% mm, of this book and then I DNF'd it because it wasn't necessarily a bad book at all. Um, I don't necessarily feel like the writing was bad or the story was bad or anything like that. This just was not the book that I thought I was going to get. And so I was bored because of the fact that I was I was in the mood for something else that wasn't this. This book is definitely literary fiction and even slightly maybe a romance at that. I was under the impression that this was more of a literary fiction that felt a little bit unhinged because, okay, they're killing husbands. Great love it. It's like a Indian practical magic type. <laughs> We're just killing bad guys. We're killing guys who are like beating on these women and getting away with it. And it's all a lie, but who cares? Like, you know, and she gets found out at some point, but everybody's like, we don't really care that, you know, you didn't kill your husband because you helped us out. I, I thought that was unhinged. It sounded great. I got to about 30% and there was no husband killing. And instead, she was kind of falling in love with somebody. I think that I am going to give this one another try when I'm in the mood for like a lit thick, light romance type of thing. But this was not it for now.
this was definitely not it. So I DNF'd it. I don't think that, I, I just want to make clear that I didn't DNF it because I think that it was a bad book or badly written or it was boring because it wasn't good. I, it, I DNF'd it and it wasn't good because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be and it wasn't on par with what I wanted to read. So there's that. And because that was 30% of me dragging through this book, which what I think I tried to drag through this for about a week, which was crazy. I lost a lot of time trying to, to get into this book. I also dragged my feet on another one, which I started at the beginning of this month during my, y'all saw me read it during my live sprints and having a great time. And then as y'all may not know, I don't have a lot of time to read physical books, which is why I love the reading sprints because it gives me time for like books that don't have audio books to still read them. It gives me three hours to literally like sit down and knock out a chunk of the book so that for the rest of the month, I can get portions of that book when I go to sleep at night, when I wind down with my partner and stuff and we read our book and whatever. Peach Pit. I had such high hopes for this book. It's supposed to be 16 stories of unsavory women. And to be honest, I checked this book out from the library, got finished with the first half, and then said, I'm going to buy this book because the first half was so great. I was like, this is an amazing anthology for me to have on my bookshelf. And I still think that the first half really is really great. I mean, the Fuckboy Mu Museum um, by, what's her, her name? Um, Disha uh, Filial. Amazing. Loved it. Relatable in the best and worst of ways. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. And again, it had like portions of it that weren't just written word. I and mean, I'm a sucker for that. So I, I really did love that first, that first um, story. Y'all saw that live. Absolutely loved it. Uh, went to Caller by K Ming Chang. Didn't love it as much as the first one, but it was still it was still po positive. It was still cool. We love an obsessive lesbian. That was interesting. Then we had All You Have Is Your Fire by Yaya Schofield. I still want to read a lot of Yaya's work. Um, and I felt like this was this is why I love anthologies. This was a soft launch into her work and loved it. It's about a young pyromaniac. Absolutely love that. Um, the Other You by Maisie Card. It took me a second to kind of get into it, but once I was in it, I really actually loved, I, I loved it. It's basically about um, these women from Jamaica and about um, basically a man who do barely exists. That's all I'm going to give you about the story. Um, and I loved it. I think that I rated it a little bit lower on my individual ratings for it because the ending felt a little too open for me to give it a full, like, really, really high rating. But that kind of comes, as I'm learning, as I'm reading more anthologies, that kind of comes with the whole anthology bit. Because <laughs> some people don't know how to necessarily close off short stories. It's very hard to do a short story. And I have respect for people who do it very, very well, to be honest. Moving on, Maps by Vanessa Chan. It was all right. I didn't really too much care for it and I think that it, this has to do something with me not really understanding like the culture behind like Asian thrillers and horror in it, there's this whole Lolita thing and this like pedo kind of situation that keeps on coming up in every single one of these books that I read like I don't know what that's about and I I, I really feel like I just need like a whole like do a lot of research because it keeps on coming up this whole Lolita um young young barely legal girl um or not legal at all girl much much older man thing that just keeps on coming up again and again and again and I just I'm like I don't get it so maps didn't hit for me but I feel like that has something to do with me rather than the actual story uh Aquafina by Shauna Porter I wanted to love but I kept on losing the plot. And I feel like even the author was losing the plot at certain points. It's supposed to be like this comparison to an Aquafina bottle. And I couldn't really get where they were going, to be honest. A scholarship opportunity by Megan Giddings made me tear up. But also we have learned that I think Megan Giddings is probably one of my favorite authors ever. Um, currently, because 
the women could fly made me cry. Uh, this short story made me tear up. I just think that she's in my mind. I think that if I met her, she'd be like, oh, did we live the same lives? Did I, did I just know about your life your entire, yes. Um, absolutely love the story of that one. Sick by Alicia Elliott, I feel like had the potential to be really great, but it just never hit, it didn't give us enough information personally, and it just never hit the absolute unhinge. Um, Miss Wrong by Chantel V. Johnson. There were parts of it that I loved, but there were parts of it that were extremely boring, so it kind of, like, hit in this midpoint for me, because it just, it didn't connect because some parts just dragged. Holes by Ashley Ash made no sense. It had no beginning. It, it just, I kept on waiting for it to make sense. I kept on waiting to go, okay, I get it. I get what this is about. And it never did. Um, and this is, this is about where it started to get very abstract, very metamorphic, very, there's a metaphor here. Um, and a way that like, just made you go, am I not smart? Or is this just not as smart as it thinks it is? The stories. This was one of them. Next was Manifestation by Sarah Rose Etter. Again, I read it. There was a lot of shock things that were happening, but I really didn't understand what the characters really meant to each other. And also like why as a woman, I should feel a connection to these to this story. It just, it felt very strange. I didn't really understand like the point of it. Buffalo by Alison Rumfett. You might know of Alison Rumfett who wrote the uh, Brain Worms uh, book that everybody has like lost their mind about, um, like about sometime last year. Um, I liked their, their, I liked it. I felt like there was a lot of anger um, and resentment and rage in the story that I kind of like appreciated and but that was the thing though is that that's all it was um but I also thought that it was interesting it calling back of course to Buffalo Bill um from uh the Science of the Lambs and wearing people as a skin and the conversation of wearing skin and and what that is in the in like the drag world and the trans world and those comparisons but as a story again it felt better more like a metaphor and at the end I kind of was left a little unsatisfied I loved everything leading up to the end and then the ending was just like and this is the ending and I was like oh, okay I kind of wanted more but okay got it and it felt kind of it read more like a poem in a way um so yeah there was that one composition by Leah Whitley I don't know what I read I, it felt like it had no beginning. It felt like it had no middle. It felt like it had no end. I read it and I got, when I finished, I got nothing from it. And I feel like stories that are very like, there's a metaphor here and very flowery in its language. I better at the end of it go, wow. Normal language just wouldn't have portrayed what this like meant and everything and so that's why I think that I rate that like harsher when there's like this flowery language it's like let there be a reason why you couldn't just straight up tell me like the message here and I didn't feel that I didn't even feel like there was a real story I didn't feel like there was a real character in in that one I was really upset with that one and then it didn't get any better because then it hit the monolith by Shia Bruvenshwar Bruvenshwar Again, it it felt like it was fan fiction of Christina Yang from um, Grey's Anatomy. It felt like it was fan fiction, but like bad fan fiction about her. And just, you read it, and then I think at some point there was some reference to 9-11. And you couldn't really figure out like what the story was really about other than this jealous surgeon and these other surgeons that honestly were shitty people so you were just kind of confused I was so confused when I finished reading it and all honesty it took me three nights three nights to read that book because I kept on falling asleep while reading it because it was just uninteresting as well it was boring it was uninteresting the main character had no 
nothing really going for her personally. Um, again, it just, it, probably the worst, my worst kind of book, the, the worst story in the book personally for me, just because it felt, again, pointless. It, I didn't, I didn't get that one whatsoever. I felt like it thought it was smarter than it was as well. Then there was A Devil's Doorbell by Amanda Luduck. I'm positive that that's probably French and I'm, it probably sounds a lot better when you say it French. But other than like now having the term the devil's doorbell for my punani, um, <laughs> which I I loved. I was like, oh, that's adorable. I'm calling it the devil's doorbell from here on out. I also felt like the metaphor wasn't strong enough. Like, I, I got what it was trying to say, but it just didn't feel as impactful as it probably should have, especially at the end. You never really got much closure. It didn't feel like an ending at all. Um, it didn't feel like it even had a beginning. It took you a very long time to start to figure out some of the things that were happening in the book as well. Um, I mean, in the story as well. So that one just wasn't impressive enough. And then by that time, I was just kind of tired of the book and I was just trying to to get it finished and, and read because of just the roller coaster of what the book was. And I finished off with Amaranth by uh, Lauren Groff, which in all honesty, thinking back, I have no real issues with. I think it was a probably a pretty entertaining story about a scorned daughter who thinks like plays like this chess long game with someone who has become her stepfather um who has killed her father and this long game with her mother who she's resentful for and there was plenty of parts of it that felt very evil and resentful and everything and I can appreciate that I just think that by the time I had gotten to that story I was so over the book that I kind of just ran through it and I was like, okay, great. I finished it finally. I don't even think that I read like the con like the acknowledgments and the contributor. I didn't even, I don't even think that I read those portions because I was just so happy to just be done with it. I know that I, I probably should because it'll give a lot of context to some of these stories and eventually I will, but I, I just, I was so disappointed by this book. And the crazy thing is I posted about this and gave it a review and everything and almost a lot of y'all was were like it's good to know that I'm not alone because that book was underwhelming and overhyped and I agree but I'm also like the 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 ones that are high that I highly rated in this book and talked about highly I really really do feel like they were worth the read like fuck I I don't regret buying this book just to have those stories on the shelf and I may even tab those stories at some point just for quick access I think that like in my rating I rated fuckboy museum all you have is spot is your fire the other you a scholarship opportunity and buffalo high like, I, I rated all of those high. I had Collar, Sick, Ms. Wrong, and Amaranth as mid-level. And then the rest of them were just like, this ruined the book. Which, for me personally, it was Maps, Aquafina, Holes, Manifestation, Composition, The Monolith, The Devil's Doorbell. Like all, like that's half the book. So you see where, like half the book is literally like, we could have lost him. We could have done, instead of 16, we could have just had eight. Which, I feel like eight is a very womanly number. I feel like, I get why it's 16, it's supposed to be sweet 16, that's why they chose that number. This was an editor issue. <laughs> And I don't know. I don't know what goes into writing an anthology. I don't know what goes into picking the authors for an anthology. Who knows? Maybe those first eight were already in the running for America's Next Top Model, and they needed to pick the other eight, and the back end eight is what pulled up the rear. You know, who knows? I don't know. But I think that that's a lot of stories to not be happy with to read this book. But also at the same time, there are eight other stories in this book that are 
completely and utterly worth your time, or at least worth your time, especially as a short story. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's very, it's very rough reviewing this book. Another rough review. I do have one that I can speak absolutely highly of. Actually, I have two that I can speak absolutely highly of. I know that was a rough start. <laughs> very rough start. The next two are very, very good. And then we have one. Get your waters because I have some thoughts. Um, but the next one is The Weight of Blood by Tiffany D. Jackson. I finally read it, y'all. After a readathon where almost everybody and their mama was reading this book, after hearing about Tiffany D. Jackson for who knows how long, I finally picked up the book. And I think the reason why I didn't pick up this book for so long was because I heard it was a Carrie retelling. I've read the book, I've watched the movie. Um, honestly, the book is better than the movie, of course. But I was just kind of like, this is a cool thought. But I don't know if, like, I need to read another Carrie retelling. Or I'll get to it at some point, you know? And I kept on hearing people go, like, this is an amazing book. This is an amazing book. I'm like, okay, I'll get to it. It's Carrie. Like, I already know the story. I honestly think it's a disservice to call this story a Carrie retelling. Because I think a lot of people write it off or don't read it yet. Or compare it to Stephen King's Carrie. I really think it's a disservice to call this a Carrie retelling. Because the only thing that is similar about Carrie and Maddie in, in The Weight of Blood are literally that they have telekinetic power, pyrotechnic powers, pyrotele, pyro, pyrotele, uh, powers that they've been bullied and they're quiet. That's it. I mean, you know, some of the characters have some similarities as well. But as for Carrie and Maddie side by side, these two girls are not the same. They have the same powers, they have some of the same, like, you know, issues at school, per se, but they, they, one thing about Carrie the book and Carrie, Carrie the movie that I was annoyed by, oh, I just want to slap the, I, I feel like I was, I feel like I was like the, the PE teacher who was rooting for her, but was just kind of like, just wake up, like, stand up for yourself, what are you doing? I just wanted her to go and snap, and instead she was just, leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And it was just like, dude, like, get a little upset. Like, Jesus, stop being like this punching bag. And that was my issue with Carrie across the board in both adaptations. Matt, whereas Carrie's shyness felt very, like, naive and at times annoying, Maddie's felt like a survival method. And it never came off necessarily annoying personally to me. That's it. I feel like where T Tiffany D. Jackson took this well-meaning jock who was taking, you know, Carrie to prom, but really had no personality, had no character. There was no arc with them, really. But you knew that, like, he seems like a nice enough guy or whatever. She sat there, took that, made an actual character. Crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> and made an actual character that had thoughts, that had feelings, that had struggles, that had awakenings that were of his own as well. Um, I honestly loved the storyline between Carrie and, and Kenny. Um, I actually loved their character arc. I love that Wendy was not this perfect character, this I'm, I'm well-meaning. I thought that that was done really well. Jules was terrifying because she felt so real in like her white woman anger, her white girl anger. And she felt justified. And that was even scarier was that she really felt justified in her anger. Um, I thought that the way that they told the story was very realistic and believable as somebody who grew up in the Midwest. Um, the complicated conversation of rationalized racism of traditional racism of we've done this for years and it's just been accepted as something that happens rather than something that feels overtly racist uh, which it is but because of traditions and because of the town you live in that rationalizes it you're just like it just it's a normal day you know um I felt like that was interesting and it was really great to kind of see that conversation kind of be be brought up in this because it's something that happens everywhere not just in these small towns in the south but like especially like you know the midwest and everything I felt like that felt so believable and realistic um the microaggressions the overt racism happening with these teenagers 
I love when there's horror books about teenagers because it's completely believable. It's like, yes, you the whole world revolves around you. You haven't grown up yet. So I loved it. I loved I loved the audiobook. I cannot I know that y'all audiobooks matter and audiobooks are amazing forms of reading because hearing this on audiobook just was so fantastic that hearing um these in between it, it through the lens of this like true crime podcast um I thought that I had gotten the the twist at the end and I didn't which was great I love that I didn't get the twist at the end I love that it left you on a little bit of a cliffhanger I loved all of that I love that the the father who's supposed to be like the the parallel to Carrie's mother had way more complicated issues than Carrie's mother then did which gave some depth. I feel like Carrie's mother was just this holy roller, you know, who had been abused herself or whatever, but like there wasn't much depth to the character as opposed to to Maddie's father who you just were like, "Oh, you're messed up." And they messed you up a long time ago. And that's why you're like this. Even like Kenny's father and like his issues and that he was problematic as like a black father. I felt like it brought up so many like very nuanced issues in this book and that made it very entertaining and nothing like the the original Carrie. So if you have not picked up The Weight of Blood because you're like, I've already read Carrie once, I've watched the movie five million times, I'll pick it up at some point, but I already know the storyline. You don't because it also did, the storyline also works very differently than I feel like Carrie did and I think that Tiffany D. D. Jackson really did a great job of taking the basis of that character and really making her own story so this was five 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 I recommend it all day it absolutely deserves the hype the next book that I read I do not have with me but it is currently on the way to me because I ordered it ASAP and that was Queen of Teeth by Haley Piper I read that as a switch like from another book that I was going to read, I'll speak about that in a minute, um, for the Trans Rights Readathon. I was looking for specifically trying to keep to theme, unhinged women written by women, and to open that and make sure that it was clear that that theme also includes trans women. And it was much harder than I expected to, especially considering a lot of trans horror and thrillers have to do with body horror for obvious political reasons. I'm a big wuss. So Brain Worms wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> I was just like, I got so many people like, read Brain Worms. And maybe one day I will, but I, I don't think so. I'm, I don't really think so. Maybe one day I'll, I'll get up the strength to do so. But I just really didn't want something that I just am not a huge fan of body horror. And that's why I hadn't picked up Queen of Teeth earlier. Because I'd seen about it. The plot literally is that Yaya, another Yaya. I've heard so many Yaya's all over the place lately. But Yaya is um, living in this dystopian future where uh, she's a Akimetra, a a Chimera. Uh, yes, a Chimera. Which basically, it's a genetic, um, I don't want to say defect, but it, it has to do with like absorbing your twin and your chromosomes. And it's built from, it was basically made from um, a government issue that happened. And so she's basically, half of her is the government's property because of basically what the government had did to these pregnant women um, while testing some of their their like new medicine and everything and one day she wakes up and she realizes there's teeth in her punani and i read that and i went uh no because if there's teeth in her punani then something's getting snapped off something's getting snapped off and as somebody who's just like i can't do the body horror i'm too squeamish i was like well i'm not gonna that just doesn't sound like something i'm gonna like I'm so happy that I was forced to pick up this book because it had nothing really to do with that. I felt like it had more, like if you've watched the movie Venom, I feel like I was telling my partner, I was like, this is basically Venom. This is Venom, but if instead of Venom and Eddie Brock, it's it's Yaya and Magenta. And I loved that as like this comic book nerd. I was like, this feels more like this sci-fi thing rather than a horror. Um, I felt like the 
personality was really interesting, not just from Yaya, but Magenta, this parasite within her. Even Doc, the other main character of the story, felt like although she was supposed to be the secondary character or like when you were reading you thought she was secondary she became this like main character so it felt like the the spotlight was shared by all three of them um magenta and yaya and doc and also i loved how it turned into not only a conversation in regards to healthcare and being this visitor in your own body and this two spirit of sorts but also like this uh, polyamorous relationship. I felt like the conversation and the sex scene that happened between the three of them um, was just done really well and wasn't, it didn't, it felt very, I don't know, like, it, I don't know if you can make like this parasite situation like make sense. I don't read a lot of monster romance whatsoever. I know that there are books out there like that maybe I'll I'll softly get into that at some point because I really felt like it was just written so well. I feel like Piper just did such an amazing job with writing that relationship and that push and pull. And while, yes, of course, there were many times, I mean, there's literally a parasite taking over her body that's opening up from her vagina. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, but it felt approachable it felt like an actual story it you actually felt feelings towards the character it just didn't feel like a blood fest and that's my like my issue most times with body horror books is that it just feels kind of like a blood fest a gore fest and as somebody who doesn't like the Saw franchise although like completely for what Jigsaw represents and what he's doing although he's a hypocrite for his own issue and institution which just deepens the conversation <laughs> I cannot watch those movies because personally it just feels like a big old gore fest that I, I'm just like, why would I want to watch this? Like it's personally for me. I know why people, other people do. I understand it. This is not a comment on what they watch it. It's just, I can't do it. Um, and I just felt like this book was not that. It, it really had depth. It had a storyline. The ending was just, I would love to see this turned into an adaptation of a film especially the ending yaya to magenta being that was created one i feel like it would have oh like it, it it would just look so creepy very evil dead resident evil type of situation um with this venom sci-fi like it, it was just so it was mind-blowing it was so so great i gave it a five absolutely a five um I now I did read some things and I knocked it down to a four and a half on a second thought and that really was only because somebody did make a really good point when I was reading some other comments and stuff and that was I just wish that Yaya would have had as much of a backstory as Doc did and I agree I feel like we learned so much about Doc and her backstory and we learn these things that were happening in Yaya's life, like her relationship with her mother, why is it how it is, or how she got to her depression the way that it was and everything. And we didn't really get a lot of backstory um, about her life before Magenta. And I think that it would have been great just to, even if it meant a longer book, to get a little bit more backstory behind Yaya so it felt like we knew all three of them very well. Um... And after that seed was planted, I thought about it and I thought about it and I was like, Ugh. okay, I'm going to knock it down half a point. So it is, it, I did give it a 4.5, I think at the end, but it was nominal. Like I absolutely recommend this book. If you are not a body horror type person, I would still recommend this to you because I don't feel like it comes from a place of just body horror and gore just to have body horror or gore. There are gross body horror portions. Yes, most definitely. Um, and I will not look at peanut butter the same again. <laughs> I also again recommend you read the audiobook you listen to the audiobook because Jen Lee killed this she did such an amazing job the voices that she was doing the, the peanut butter this I can't even do it but it it was such a fun read and I really felt like listening to it really took it over the edge because of just how amazing it was so I have ordered that it is going to be on my shelf I'm so happy I am really looking forward to reading more of Haley Piper's work um but that was such a great surprise
honestly. Now, I'm going to end my wrap up with the book that I was originally going to choose for the Trans Rights Readathon. And then after being told by a couple of followers, after posting that I was going to be reading it, um, about a couple, a little bit of information about the author and doing some research, I realized that I did not feel comfortable continuing on with promoting the book or talking about the book. Still plan on maybe reading the book. I've already bought it. Um, but I think I wouldn't have had I known some of the news and like just some of the viewpoints that the author has. And that's Manhunt uh, by Gretchen Felker Martin. I was really looking forward to reading this because I had heard so much about it, especially last year. It's this dystopian novel. J.K. Rowling type is burned alive at the stake in the in the book. Um, it has to do with base. I mean, it's it's the end of the world and everyone's gone crazy. And I was looking so forward to what happens between the three main characters in this book. I'm still going to read it because I still do feel like it still sounds like an amazing story. I was sent just to start off my research and I really appreciate y'all for you know telling me about the author without like you know berating me like why don't you know this or whatever. I appreciate the respectfulness of like I love when people just we are social on the social platform <laughs> and not just well you should know this already. It's just like some I don't know what to look for if I'm not looking for it, you know? I wouldn't know to, t and even, I think that uh, Felker Martin's, like, press PR people have done an, uh, a really great, great job of uh, of really pushing down a lot of the, the news about this. I literally had to Google her name along with biphobia in order to get the information I was even getting in the first place. So I, I appreciate y'all kind of leading me to that. Which, yeah, leads me to my issue with the author. Um, after doing some research and looking around, the author, who's now no longer on Twitter um, because of the issues that were coming up around her um, and her, what she's saying, what she was liking, there was a lot of biphobia, a huge amount of biphobia. And while I, as somebody who's bisexual, identifies as bi bisexual, understand some of the frustration and anger that comes from, like, the queer community towards us sometimes because of the fact that, you know, accord, like, you know, we're the acceptable queer, according to, you know, the heteronormative society, especially as a woman, a cis woman. And I can understand the frustration. Y'all's frustration is not with us. Y'all's frustration is with the society that we live in. And unfortunately, a lot of us who are cis women who are bisexual, especially women of color, because I've talked to a lot of other bisexual women of color um, in the same situation, don't really realize that we're bisexual for an extremely long time because of how normalized society makes it for us to appreciate another woman sexually. Um, I grew up thinking, well, I'm not blind. I know a woman's fine if she's fine. And then after having many conversations with other women, I realized my appreciation of thinking a woman was fine was not the same as their appreciation for thinking a woman was fine. Um, and even realizing that I was actually more so sexually attracted to women um, physically than I was to men, although I'm, it's a whole situation. But I think that people like that who devalue um, the bisexual cis woman experience as queer are part of the problem as to why so many bisexual cis women don't come out as bisexual, don't feel welcome in the community, and honestly continue the rest of their lives thinking or putting out there that they're straight, regardless of their sexual feelings. Um, and honestly, a lot of what the author had to say devalued who I was as somebody who identifies in the queer community. I'm bisexual cis woman in a hetero semen relationship with a hetero cis man. And according to this author, that's not queer. I'm not queer. And regardless of what you may think politically about that, I personally identify as that. And for a very long time, I wasn't able to because of these thought processes. So 
I didn't, I appreciate whoever like put, a couple of y'all had kind of put me on and started my research. And after looking at it, I just did not feel comfortable putting anything else out about this author on my page. And in the future, I won't be reading anything from her um, because essentially she doesn't think that like my sexual identity exists. And so I don't think that I want to pursue or promote anybody who honestly doesn't think that I'm valid enough to call myself queer in any sense of the word or that I'm not queer enough. And that's extremely problematic. So I think that um, eventually, maybe one day I will read this because I did already buy it. I think that the story itself really sounds interesting. And I thought that it was going to be a really great pick for especially the theme that I was doing. It was right on the money for an unhinged woman written by a woman. Um, but I didn't know that I was going to be reading about an unhinged woman written by an unhinged woman. <laughs> that sucked. But the bright side of all of that is that I was able to read Queen of Teeth, which was an absolutely amazing read. So this was still a win. A win is a win. <laughs> so yeah, that is my wrap up for this last month. It was a crazy month. I had a DNF. I had a book that I absolutely did not start because I didn't, I didn't appreciate the thoughts behind the author. I had a book that I had high hopes for and ended up being at least half of it was disappointing. I, <laughs> I had another book that I'm still trying to figure out how I feel about it. But I also had two amazing books that I read. So I'm trying to focus on that in an effort to not end up in a reading slump. Because looking at it, the really Queen of Teeth and The Weight of Blood saved this month. It really kicked up things to get me excited about reading it again. Because mid-month, I think for two weeks I was working on the same book because of how slow it was, because I wasn't enjoying it. But I am glad that I ended the book, the, the month with Queen of Teeth, because I feel like it got me ready and revved up to start for next month, which, little sneak peek, uh, the theme is going to be based on my birthday month. My birthday is next it's next week god as I'm filming this but it's next month as well it's in April and I thought there's no real like you know national holiday or national month for April to be honest and so I was like okay well that's perfect because in all honesty maybe it's just a reflective month for me maybe I read books based on me and my experience in this last year of myself and as I'm turning 29 my last year of my 20s I think it would be dope to kind of be preemptive and reflect on my 20s and what I've learned so far especially with the crazy time 28 was um, for me personally um and I thought that I would combine that with the old school April challenge that uh, Slime and Slashers here on YouTube is doing for the month of April. Go check her out. She's a lot, but she is giving Nickelodeon guts realness. Like it is, it is like goosebumps. And honestly, it's just such a fun challenge and it's so nostalgic. And it's really an easy challenge for you to participate in because the, the prompts really can be like, used for anything. It doesn't have to be something that is like overtly 90s or 80s or whatever for you. Um, and I loved that. But I also loved how nostalgic it was. So next month, I will be trying to either <laughs> read only books taking place in the 90s. And I would love to read books that were published in 1985. But I still have to pick out my TBR. And I don't know how likely that's going to be to be honest. So I think my main goal is to read books from the 90s and maybe fit in a book or two that has nothing to do with the 90s but really has to do with things that I've realized about myself in the last this last decade. And I'm excited for that. I'm stressed out on what I'm gonna read because I still don't know what it is. And we're basically sitting on the last day of March as I'm recording this basically. But I'm, I think it's a really interesting theme and something different. And I'm hoping that it's, it's fun. I, I don't know. We, we, we're going, we're going to see. Also, April's halfway to Halloween. So just know that I told you about that and that there may be something or two 
things coming up for that celebration. I'm going to be participating in Sick Sad World, a Sick Sad April that is hosted by Apple Alchemy on Instagram. So there's gonna be a lot of illustrations going out around that with books, recommendations, and flat lays. So there's a lot going on in April. Um, but I'm excited. I'm excited to celebrate doing some of the things I love most, which is drawing and reading and Halloween and the 90s and nostalgia. And <laughs> I'm hoping that y'all stick around to check that out on whatever I end up doing. I have a little bit of some plans, but we will see where they go, to be honest. It's a little bit week to week, to be honest. Um, so yeah, I had a great time going through all of this with y'all today. We, here's to thinking April will be a better month. I believe that it will. I, I just think it was a little bit of a fluke halfway through this month. But, but here's to thinking April's gonna be better. Subscribe down below if you're looking forward to any other of my videos. They're a little bit like this one. I'm I'm starting to get back into some thrifting, so there's gonna be some thrifting next month. Um, and some crafting, hopefully. Some movie watching. A little bit more than just books. But then we'll get back into the books. But it's mainly because I'm coming up on halfway to Halloween. <laughs> I just want to get there. <laughs> so subscribe down below. Give me a like if you liked today's video. And I'll see you on the next one. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.